And it's my honor and duty to present tonight's featured poet. He comes to us from Ohio. It's not his first visit. Some of you may remember our featured poet when he came here on a social literary mission to collect poetry books for donations to libraries. And I'm happy to announce that uh, some of those books made their way to the Erie County Public Library. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks to our featured poet. He's here tonight to share his poetry. Ryan, you'll explain the book stand too. I He's sure will. A publisher, at least recently. Ryan, come on up here. Let's hear it for Ryan G. So lots of all the fun announcements. So uh, that project for donating books was called Words to the Wise. We wound up with over 250 donations. This is our second year doing it. We had about seven libraries we chose. Um, Erie was the only Pennsylvania one. The rest were local to Ohio. Um, each library got about 40 books. So they've got a nice little collection going on now. Um, on that, it's National Poetry Month. So I open up submissions during this month to make those books you see back there. If you are a writer and you want one of those little books, there's info. I'll make it for you. We print them for free. We printed them for free. I just lost my press because I got caught. <laughs> um, so I'm still seeking new options for that and funding. Uh, but what is left of it right now is back there. We do not have every single book. Uh, we have most of them back there, but we have 28 different books we currently publish. And they're all those little mini bifolds that are free. So if you're interested, help let us spread your words. All right, that's enough of me. You guys want to hear poetry now. We're going to start with the first adult thing I ever wrote. It's called The Blue Collar Lament. I spend most of my week in a semi-conscious trance, watching multi-million dollar machines work. They are more alive than I am. Monday at 3 p.m., I click off my brain, switch on automatic, and begin the countdown. T minus 40 hours. Each minute that ticks by in the dull monotony slowly steals my sanity bit by bit. The vampire conglomerate that signs my check robs you my youth, intelligence, and vitality until I am just another mindless automaton. These walls are masters of time. Each minute closer to Friday gets slower and slower, until on Friday they seem to tick backwards. Then, on Monday, the entirety of the previous week repeats. Each day blurs into the other, making them indistinguishable. The dictator they put in charge of the asylum barks out the man's IQ, just to remind everyone that they own you. All the while, he never realizes that he's just another puppet dancing with them, only his strings are shorter. When they inevitably cut them, he has further to fall. I often welcome sleepwalking through most of the week. In the few instances the machines malfunction, I curse being awakened. At least, as a zombie, I don't feel my mind rotting. I live on the weekends. I shed the identity the uniform has forced upon me, and my true self emerges. On the weekends, I love life. I achieve the goals I value. Not the hazy path set before me by the corporation that owns my soul. For two days, the dungeon master gives me a reprieve from my incarceration. Upon clocking out each Friday, I suddenly feel rejuvenated. While Sunday night, I begin writing the impending column. The desperation for dollars are the shackles that keep me here. I am only truly living two days a week and dying the other five. I've made a pact with the devil, five sevenths of my life for weekly pittance. Until the decay of my body matches that of my brain, I return weekly to mind-numbing tedium, the memory of my weakened existence fading into the background. So this was written in 2008 while I was on the job. <laughs> of course, it was uh, organized into sensibility on a weekend. They caught this once, too, in a printer at that job. <laughs> you know how I classified it? I looked at the, my the plant manager and said, uh, let me guess, after work, you go home, you have a drink, you relax, right? right. Yeah, this is what I do. <laughs> all right, being that it's National Poetry Month, you guys get a little reprieve from just hearing all my own work. 
I'm going to share a few other people's works that are in some of those fancy little books you see over there. So this is the Analog Kingdom. It was an art book uh, meant to accompany a sculpture that was a throne made out of working TVs. It is not in this book, but the cross made out of them that predates it is in here. So some of you might remember Josh Romig. He's one of their published writers. This is TRNT. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will be live. The revolution will be streaming through your windows, laptops, and smartphones. The revolution will be blogged, tweeted, liked, shared, reblogged, retweeted, and stumbled upon in between midnight masturbation sessions, sandwiched between funny cat memes. The, re the resolution will be HD. The evolution will be high speed. The whistles will be blown out with frequency. The revolution will be commented on, scrutinized, vandalized, scandalized, stylized, and advertised. People will pay attention. People will forget to mention that some stand up, occupy, riot, and die. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will be streaming live through the filter of your choice. The facts will be democratized. The democracy will be corporatized. The corporations will be personified. People objectified, spied on, villainized. The powers that be will lie, deny, and try to justify. The people will be disenfranchised. Priv prisons will be privatized. Death drones will be utilized. No one will bat an eye. Because revolution will be multiplied, oversimplified, the violence normalized, lies sacrificed to satiate the golden calf's appetite. The revolution will not be televised, but Jerry Springer will. Co figure. <laughs> All right, back to me for a minute. It's called The Moment. The Japanese girl sits quietly on the pier, gazing out over the water. Her silent and knowing glance says more than either of our languages could ever comprehend. She is beautiful in her hopelessness, hopelessness, and I, dumbstruck in awe of a piece I will never know. She sits behind me squawking with an adolescent banter that must seem dire. Her intensity of voice speaks the same thing I had secretly wished for years but been too afraid to say. Please, pay attention to me. Speak I did, for the very first time. This awkward message of youthful adoration is not exactly communicated articulately. Her only response is, God, I hate you. Please shut up. If I am already taking risks with my life, then I will not be silenced. For once, I will not back down. You love me. You just don't know it yet. We are inexplicably sat on the very edge of the river, the smell of Texas barbecue intensifying our hunger. Half our small group is exhausted proving their technical prowess. While I declare that this most manly of feasts must be a competition to prove our testosterone, why simply dine in San Antonio when you can challenge your friends to a banquet of sauce-laden meats? I declare that he who finishes least or last must surrender his manhood. The balls are on the table tonight. I awoke early this morning and slipped quietly out of my bunk. My compatriots were still sleeping off a hangover. I pushed open the door hundreds of years my senior and witnessed the burgundy sunset of French wine country. Just now, just think, right now, I could be meaninglessly staring at rolling machinery. I placed another valve on the pump and were hypnotically tightening it down. The sound has become a meditation now. The zen is broken when my radio squeals. The producer has just jumped on the air. The World Trade Center is on fire. I place my wrench slowly down on the table, confused. We all do. We all are. In a half an hour, we'll all be sitting around the table, listening to Howard Stern speculate on a horror. We are blinded to the true terror, what this really means until hours later. Snow continues to flood my windshield as I wind precariously around the bespectacled Alleghenies. The city below, shrouded in the early winter light, looks as though the heavens have finally released the weight of the stars to the ground. As I marvel at this, a twinge of fear arises. I may not find shelter tonight. Nonetheless, the road levels out and an exit is offered as salvation. In the midst of planned itineraries, sightseeing, and tourist attractions, I had lost track of time. I am resigned to sleep the night in a Walmart parking lot. When I pull off the exit, however, I am pleased to see the welcoming glow of a mall. There, I discover an establishment long since lost to the ether of my youth. As I sit there eating the 10,000 calorie hot dog, I ponder. This was what life was like when it was simpler, when I thought I knew what it was all about, until I was proven horribly wrong. In the midst of the audacious and elaborate splendor of Florence, I see a sight so simple 
and yet so much more our monument to man's unfathomable capacity for love and compassion. A rose, brown and dead, is stuck in a chain link fence. Attached to it is a small handwritten note that reads, Kiss her now. I am in her arms, having been told no, and resigned to rejection so many times, so many times I told myself that this would never happen. As my lips touch hers, I laugh inside my head. Is this really happening? This is really happening. I hold my breath. I can see him through the window, as I have seen him through the electronic window of my TV for years. As I get closer, this feels less and less real. This is my hero, my God. He has accomplished amazing things and pushed the limits of the human body. Suddenly, I am in front of him. He looks up and smiles as he says hello. All the nervousness, the anxiety disappears. When I realize that my God is a man, a man like me, I am terrified. Before me is a discolored, screaming, clawing, misshapen, alien creature. My son takes his first breaths of real air. We are all exhausted. His mother looks at me with a look that practically screams, We did it! I believe, but we're not done doing it yet, are we? His gurgles turn into cries, and I know. I know that this, this is the moment that matters more than any of my life. I will never have a single moment matter than this ever will. And while I stare into his bed, I hope he proves me wrong. Everything that's in that guy actually happened in real life. All right. Another not me. This is from our book, Anonymous America. That is me in the back of my costume. Uh, this is by a friend of mine who is in several of these books, but I will convince him to let me make his own. This is uh, Static Skies by Eli Williams. Static skies, torn American flags represent democratic tenacity to endanger the human species. Robotic skies, tuned to static channels, vessel hollowed, hollowed bodies, workers, spit shredded flags, fire charred, burned down country store, sold Bibles and liquor to those who could afford, drowning away their sorrows. Uniformed men dread taking away their friends. Cocktails of fire splashing on fire skin, mirrored from depraved eyes. Children who crave some semblance of peace. All right, so this is one of the few over there that's all me. So I'm going to give you a little story on this one. This one is more prose. It's called Snow Day. <laughs> Motherfucking damn it. The car is stuck. Forward or reverse, the tires just spin, taunting me. White powder, fluffy on top, from thick and heavy at the bottom, is piled above my hood. This fucking thing's not going anywhere. Now what? Another of Ohio's freak snowstorms in April. Winter's one last fuck you. A send-off reminding us that he'll be back. My Cavalier is no match for several feet of snow, and I'm stuck two miles from home. I don't usually mind the winter. I like the variety. I love the calm the white blankets bring, silencing and hiding all the filth of our careless summer decadence. It's a splendor I'll never be able to create, a peace I will never know. But today, winter screwed me with the heat. Just not today. April 25th, her day. I glance around. I left my phone at home, too. I didn't want to hear from anyone. No one telling me it'll be okay. I have to get out of here. I can't sit here. Winter's trying to stop me, slow me down. Nothing stops when it catches me. If I stop, I think. The cold catches up with me. I catch up with myself. I click on the flashers. I guess I'm walking. I open the door and immediately I'm assaulted by a frigid gust. I crunch into the snow and realize water resistant does not mean waterproof. I close the door with a light thud, look ahead, and resign myself to a miserable walk, hoping that the angered flush in my face keeps me warm. I begin walking one step at a time. My head is cast to the ground. Each time I try to look up, my head gets knocked right back down. My, want, my mind wanders to the scheduled routine of the day. I'm not making it to work. I look back at my car. The door I just slammed is already buried. In a few minutes, all that will be left is a couple of blinking lights fading into the background. I remember how much I used to love snow days as a kid. Now, it just means I could lose my job. I've been on thin ice for the last year. My work has suffered. My heart's not in it anymore. My heart's not in anything anymore. I just don't care. The only reason I'm still there is I'm desperate to cling to something stable. Something, anything. That house she left me with, that car, that thing that represented freedom since I was 16 when I first asked her to be mine. 
which is now a rusty death trap, stagnant and immobile, immobile on this wasteland road in the middle of nowhere. Who wouldn't be surprised if my job wasn't already drafting my termination letter? How the hell am I going to pay my mortgage? Or for that car I apparently need? A violent arctic chill hits me in the chest, penetrating my jacket and blowing right through me, trying to rob me of any warmth I have left. <laughs> Tough luck, you bastard. You won't find much there. I look where I've been again, following the chill of my eyes. My car is long since gone, a memory hidden beneath a curtain of iridescence. My footprints disappear the moment I made them, and beneath any evidence of my every struggle, long before I can make another move. Before me is an unpainted canvas of nothing, a void so much more ominous than the blackness of night. The white, a light, promises more than it ever has to offer. She's a cruel lover who will let you in, expand into your pupils, as you think you are seeing for the very first time. She will explode into your mind and fill you with the euphoria of hope. But it's a lie. She wipes the slate clean and decides, this canvas was never meant to be painted on. At least, not by me. Better to have the black. It might hide all the horrors and fears of childhood, but it's honest. It never offers false, altruistic promises. Sure, it's a mask, but no more than my own face pretending that it does not crack in the mirror. My steps are getting harder now. Ice has encased my work boots. My toes have long since ceased any feeling. My face stings with every gust. I only inch four, one foot at a time, with every ounce of my will. Religion says, it is in these times when Jesus walks with you, or whatever, deity. My footprints vanish before I can make them. I certainly see no others beside me. Even he gave up trying to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. Atlas shrugged, and all I got were two broken vertebrae. <laughs> what the hell am I? Why the hell am I still trying? Nothing I do makes any difference. Come and get me now. I'm here, I scream. If Kubrick could see me now, his little cockroach would be laughing its ass off at this futile scene. A single tear slides down my cheek, warm and harsh against the bitter cold. I haven't been able to cry since she left. Just numb, so cold, void of anything but her. I take a deep breath. That hurts too. I can't remember what it's like not to hurt. I'm still plodding on, one foot in front of the other, one step at a time. Each moment takes an eternity to feel. I should just let go and fall. When the fall comes, they'll find an empty car with its lights flashing and an even emptier person with no light left in him. Why did she do this to me? Why the fuck am I always alone? Why am I so fucking cold? A salty torrent begins to burn my face. Mucus slides into a week's worth of stubble. I can't do this. As I say this, feel this, finally feel anything, I slow. The weight in my heart getting heavier with every step. I'm still moving. In the distance, partially shrouded in a cascade of flurries, I begin to make out something of familiarity. My driveway. Behind it, I see my porch and a maroon door. My home finally comes into view, and the lights are still on. I hope you weren't expecting anything happy with a title like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I love this one. This is the Jigsaw Project. This is where we take other people's poems, cut them up, and make new ones. Many times I do that by taking quotes at these poetry readings. Now, this one in the back of this book was from our very first workshop. It was done a little differently. This is what I call a patchwork. It's where we're all giving one prompt and told only to write a stanza. And then we all as a group put all those stanzas together into one poem. So this is called Patchwork Dreams, and it was by Aaron Kasunik, Amanda Whitlock, Morgan Blackboard, Josh Romig, myself, and Valentine Berlin. The block is killing me. A million thoughts stopped by a lacking syllable. The start? Could it be? Should it be? I'll fill the silence with doubt, waiting for the right sounds while the deadline looms. These dreamers in my mind have stopped dancing, tired of waiting for the music. Paint splashes grayscale, patches together in swatches, blending to erase the boundaries I never follow anyways. It's been years since my guidelines were straight enough to stay inside, yet it's where I prefer to be. I've been poor, so poor, that harvesting cigarette butts to squeeze the tobacco out was the only way to smoke. So poor that I had to carve a pipe out of a carrot to smoke that tobacco. Yes, I've been poor. Poverty is a misery, but I'm crafty. So, so living those problems, making do is how I survive. Yes, I've been poor, and I carry the scars to prove it. Blue, swoop, pull, no. 
loop, swoop, pull, still no. Mom's getting fed up. I'm sorry. I just can't do it. I race through the shop door. The natural light stings my wet eyes. And the chill stops me for an instant. My mother screams behind me, get the fuck out of here. I am sobbing, finding it difficult to breathe as I choke down mucus and blood. My lip is already starting to swell. Tomorrow, she'll try to bribe my forgiveness with some useless object, another fucking worthless sentiment from a parent who never stopped being a child. It's so soggy, everything. The grass, the hay, the sky, and my crotch. Presently soaked in blood. Two periods in one month. Yay for me, soggy. Everything. Jesus died because I'm a sinner. I'm on my knees for the fifth time this week, trying to find my salvation on this bathroom floor, penetrated by the needle full of bubbling holy light. <laughs> I'm drunk and so pissed out right now. There is no God. If there was, he would have saved me. Or at least given me a bigger dick. <laughs> Before the arthritis set in, I could grab a dick. They called them handies back then, and I was very accomplished. My grip was magical, and Old Faithful would quietly make a show. <laughs> I'm as dead as America the fall. The dead-eyed liberal zombies are coming to knock down the walls of my panic room, picketing my rights. They had half a brain to put down those signs and pick up a gun. It's already past 11. The kids are long since asleep. I quietly stick the key in the lock and try to open the door without the usual creak. I drop my briefcase in the hall, as though the weight, the full weight of 70 hour work weeks were stored within. I loosen my tie and walk to the fireplace. There, I spot the kids, dead to the world on the couch, waiting for Santa. He's finally here, as I bend to sight another present out of the tree. Memory corrupted, trying to recover, installing, installing, installing the good data. Recover the bright, installing, installing, deleting viruses, replace corrupted data, installing, installing, waiting for completion, installing, ready to carry on, installing. I got some dirty friends. Of course, one of those is mine, too. All right, I think I might be at my time. You guys want anything else? One more. One more? Was that Chuck who just said that? Oh, right. oh good, because the next one's Chuck's. He's the boss. <laughs> we didn't set that up, right? Not at all. So this is Power of the Powerless. It is the only book I think I don't have back there. We do have digital versions if you're interested, though. This is Wind Power by Chuck Joy. Power to the powerless. Make some reckless, jocular, mewling babies, tattooed, ignored. The one guy reading a magazine, a blind dog, and Lita King, how did they get along before us, constantly in the darkness? Unless the powerless is us, the power of consciousness, the power of dance denied to rocks. Even plants can dance. Right on.